to start with uh, coming out of the learning outcomes from this class we would like you to know uh, like you to classify gingivitis and explain the various stages of gingivitis and then to describe the clinical features of gingivitis list the causes for melanin pigmentations and compare the clinical and histopathological appearance of gingivitis so these are the uh, contents of the and uh, first coming on to the classification so 2017 classification of the periodontal diseases has classified uh, a separate entity called periodontal health and uh, gingival diseases as well so uh, regarding periodontal health and gingival health we will be speaking it in the uh, lecture regarding classification uh, so this class we will uh, focus on gingivitis so you have two different types of gingivitis one is dental biofilm induced that is a plaque induced another is non-dental biofilm induced so to start with the case definition for gingival health means that a state where it is free of uh, any inflammatory periodontal disease whereas gingivitis uh, has been defined where clinical signs and symptoms of inflammation that are confined to the free and attached gingiva alone and does not extend beyond the mucogingival junction so this has been given as a case definition for gingivitis in the present 2017 classification and gingivitis has been classified as dental biofilm induced and non biofilm induced dental bi uh, biofilm induced has further been classified as non periodontitis and stable periodontitis so we'll be speaking this about this in the next uh, slides so to start with gingivitis which is dental biofilm induced so this is a state of periodontal inflammation which is confined to the gingival tissues and related to the dental biofilm so if there is presence of plaque then you call it as a gingivitis due to dental biofilm induced so in this case uh, gingivitis has been defined localized if there is uh, no probing attachment loss no radiographic bone loss less than 3 mm of pocket depth and if there is uh, 10 to 30 percentage of site uh, teeth bleeding on probing whereas it is called as generalized gingivitis if there is again no probing attachment loss no bone loss present less than 3 mm of pocket depth and if the probing bleeding on probing is more present on more than 30 percentage of the teeth so the differentiating factor between localized and generalized gingivitis is that there is 10 to 30 percentage of bleeding on probing and there is more than 30 percentage of this teeth bleeding on probing in case of generalized gingivitis so gingivitis in a reduced periodontium without the history of periodontitis uh, in case in such cases you would be having a uh, condition such as recession which is occurring because of cervical abrasion so such conditions you directly cannot classify as periodontitis so you have a separate entity in the 2017 classification where we call it as gingivitis in a reduced periodontium without a history of periodontitis so according to this uh, definition so it has been uh, told as there is a probing attachment loss present in these conditions there is a bo radiographic bone loss present in these conditions but the probing pocket depth is less than 3 mm so this is the differentiating factor between a true periodontitis and a such kind of false periodontitis and the localized and generalized remains the same so next coming on to gingival diseases due to non-dental biofilm induced so these are a state of gingival diseases wherein it is induced by non-plaque induced pathologic lesions so you have such a lot of lesions relating to bacterial origin viral origin and fungal origin limited to the gingival tissues although these lesions are not caused by the plaque directly their clinical course may be impacted by uh, plaque accumulation and subsequently gingival inflammation can occur so further uh, it has gingivitis has also been divided uh, according to the 99 classification as acute gingivitis where as the term acute suggests as sudden onset of short duration and can be painful recurrent gingivitis where it has been um, uh, reappears after having been eliminated by treatment and disappearing spontaneously chronic gingivitis which is slow in onset it is painless unless it is complicated by acute exacerbations uh, and is the most often encountered uh, fluctuating uh, encountered type it, there could be fluctuating disease in which inflammation persists or dissolves and normal areas becomes inflamed 
So this is a study which was done by Lowe wherein he demonstrated that uh, in students with clinically healthy gingiva, the clinical symptoms of gingivitis this, uh, develops within two to three weeks with uh, two to three weeks. But then within uh, with adequate tooth cleaning, the gingival inflammation subsides within a week. During this study, he also found that the thickness of the gingival plaque gradually increased during the three-week experimental period. So during the first few days when the students were asked not to brush their teeth, he found that there was gram-positive cocci and rods representing indigenous microflora of the tooth surface. But then when the uh, plaque control was not present for more than four to five days, the organism's quality changed to filamentous organisms or gram-negative cocci as well as rods gradually non-attaching spirochetes as well as appeared in the gingival sulcus while the assortment of microorganisms in the gingival biofilm increased continuously. So what are the major characteristics of gingivitis? So if gingivitis is present in a person, you could see plaque which is present at their gingival margin. There could be disease which has started in the gingival margin, a change in the color, contour, temperature change, increased gingival excrete, bleeding upon provocation, absence of attachment loss, absence of bone loss, histological changes which are seen during inflammatory lesion and it is reversible with the help of plaque control. So if all these conditions persist then we tell such condition to be a gingivitis condition. So here you can see a stage of chronic gingivitis where the marginal and the interdental gingiva are smooth and edematous and discolored. Uh, isolated responses of acute uh, response of gingivitis can be seen. And again, this is a localized form. Uh, so it's a generalized form and this is a localized form where only one teeth is involved. So according to distribution, uh, the picture has been shown to you previously. The localized, it is only confined to one teeth, generalized when an entire set of teeth is involved. Marginal gingivitis when only the gingival margin is involved and papillary gingivitis when only the interdental papilla is present. But often it extends to the adjacent portion of the gingival margin also and the earliest signs of gingiva, gingivitis occurs in the papilla. Diffuse gingivitis is another term which affects the gingival margin, anti gingiva and the interdental papilla. Mostly we go by uh, the terms localized gingivitis or generalized gingivitis. The terms of marginal gingivitis, papillary gingivitis and diffuse gingivitis are re less, re less uh, used during uh, telling, about a, uh, telling about a condition. So here you can see a, a case of generalized gingivitis um, where there is a, a, a marginal gingivitis present. The second picture shows that there is marginal gingivitis as well as papillary gingivitis. The third picture shows there is a diffuse gingival enlargement of all the three, uh, three gingiva. Now coming on to the stages of gingivitis. You, uh, Bayesian Schroeder summarized widely scattered studies on pathogenesis of periodontitis and they comprised all these studies and they came up with four stages of gingivitis. The first one is the initial lesion where it is equivalent to a clinical healthy gingival tissue. Here uh, it occurs immediately after the plaque accumulation. Two to four days uh, after the plaque accumulation, you will be having vascular dilatation or vasculitis of the blood vessels. There could be even uh, a, a change of uh, uh, blood vessels would be present. And during this stage, uh, the very first cells of defense which comes into play is the neutrophils. So the neutrophils are the first line of defense cells. So they come into play when plaque is first accumulated in the gingiva. Along with that, you could see some perivascular loss of collagen present. And the initial clinical uh, feature which is present is an increased gingival fluid flow. Later, when the plaque accumulation is still present for around 4 to 7 days, you develop the early lesion or otherwise early gingivitis which is clinically evident. So here, in this case, the blood vessels get, there is a vascular proliferation. The junctional epithelium and the circular epithelium shows red apex and atrophic areas. Uh, the immune cells which are predominant are the lymphocytes and there is increased loss around the, uh, increased loss of collagen around the infiltrate. Erythema and bleeding on probing are the clinical features which are seen during this condition. So uh, an evident uh, subjective uh, 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 as well as objective 
clinical evidence is through uh, checking during this stage of bleeding on probing established lesion um, otherwise So coming on to the established lesion, so this occurs 14 to 21 days after the plaque has been accumulated. So this combines both the features of stage 2 as well as stage 3. It is more advanced uh, junctional epithelium and uh, cycle epithelium changes could be seen. Uh, the predominant cells here are the plasma cells and there is continued loss of collagen present. There are changes in color, texture, uh, contour during this uh, stage of gingivitis. The last stage is an advanced lesion. So this marks the transition from gingivitis to periodontitis. So during this time, there's a predominance of neutrophils, dense inflammatory and cell infiltrate, apical migration of junctional epithelium to preserve an intact epithelial barrier, continued collagen loss and osteoclastic absorption of alveolar bone could also take place, which naturally means that it is going to enter inside the periodontitis phase. So this is uh, these are the four stages of gingivitis, which is very important. Uh, for you to understand. So next coming on to the gingival examination. So the first two earliest signs of gingival inflammation uh, as shown in the previous stages uh, slide is, are the increased gingival cravicular fluid and bleeding from the gingival sulcus. Apart from that you could see changes of color, size, color, size, the contour, the consistency, the surface texture, the position of the gingiva all could be checked and separation also could be checked. So this all are the gingival examination features which we have to carry. Uh, during the next slides we will be seeing uh, what are the different gingival, what is the normal uh, gingival features and what are the different features which you see during the uh, gingival diseases. So first to start with bleeding on probing since it's very important. So this is widely used uh, measure to measure the disease prevalence and progression. It is also used to measure the outcome of the treatment and to motivate the patient's home care. Gingival bleeding is an important diagnostic factor. The presence of plaque only for two days can initiate the gingival bleeding on probing. Whereas once established, it may take seven days or more after uh, the continued plaque control and treatment to eliminate the gingival bleeding. So the presence of bleeding uh, uh, denotes that there is an active gingival inflammation. And until it is not controlled, there is a risk of continuing periodontal disease and tissue distribution. Even though gingival bleeding on probing may not be a good indicator for clinical attachment loss, its absence is an excellent negative predictor of future attachment loss. Therefore, the absence of gingival bleeding on probing is desirable and implies a low risk of future clinical attachment loss. Chronic and recurrent bleeding. Uh, it, this might be provoked by mechanical trauma like for example from toothbrush, toothpicks, food impaction or by biting into solid food such as apples. The severity of bleeding and the ease of its provocation depends on the intensity of the inflammation. After the vessels are ruptured and damaged, interrelated mechanisms induce hemostasis. So what are the histological changes that occur during abnormal gingival bleeding? There could be a dilatation or engorgement of capillaries along with thinning and ulceration of the circular epithelium. So here you can see in the picture that there is a, a uh, the, the thinning of the circular epithelium may, uh, might result in more amount of bleeding which may occur. Since the capillaries are present at a closer surface to this area to, to the circular epithelium and since the uh, epithelium or the circular epithelium is thinned out during the disease, the degenerated epithelium is less protective and therefore any stimuli like for example plaque or any mechanical stimuli naturally would cause rupture of the capillaries and would result in gingival bleeding. So acute bleeding, laceration, uh, it, this could be caused by any conditions which uh, which we do it uh, uh, by uh, by any by any wrong motives. Like for example, that could be a Laceration of the gingiva by toothbrush, bristles or by sharp pieces of hard food. Gingival burns from hot foods or chemicals, spontaneous bleeding or bleeding on slight provocation can cause 
So gingival bleeding is also associated with systemic changes. Like for example, it could occur in vitamin C deficiency or any allergy conditions, any platelet disorders, uh, other coagulation defects could also result in changes in your gingival bleeding. Uh, the effects of hormone replacement therapy, oral contraceptives and men menstrual cycle has also been reported to affect the gingival bleeding. Several reports have noted shown notable effects of fluctuating estrogen and progesterone having a problem uh, in uh, uh, resulting in gingival bleeding. Among the pathologic endocrine changes, diabetes is an endocrine condition with a well-characterized effect on gingivitis. It is also important to consider the medications like aspirin's effect on bleeding during a routine dental checkup to avoid false positive readings which could result in inaccurate patient diagnosis. So next coming on to the color changes in gingiva. The color changes of the gingiva is determined by various factors like by including the number and size of the blood vessels, the epithelial thickness, the quantity of the keratinization and the pigments within the epithelium. So color changes in chronic gingivitis uh, is an important sign of gingival disease. The normal color is coral pink and this is produced by tissue vascularity and is modified by the overlying epithelial layers. The color becomes pale when the vascularization is reduced or the epithelial keratinization increases. So because of the uh, melanin pigmentation, melanin cells, you do have melanin pigmentation in certain people and this is also sometimes racial. The changes start in the interdental papilla when there is a color change because of disease and gingival margin and then it spreads to the atta gingiva. So proper diagnosis and treatment require an understanding of the tissue changes that alter the color of the gingiva at the clinical level. So color changes in acute diseases. So it differs uh, in nature and distribution from that of the chronic gingivitis conditions. So the color changes may be marginal, diffuse, patch-like, depending on the underlying condition. Like for example, in acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, it is it could be marginal. Whereas in herpetic gingival stomatitis, it could be diffuse, the color change. In acute reactions due to chemical irritation, it could be patch-like or diffuse. Color changes vary with the intensity of the inflammation as well. So here, uh, the, the, even certain metals like for example, heavy metals such as bismuth, uh, you can see a bismuth line, uh, metal uh, uh, metallic pigmentation which is occurring here in a patient taking bismuth therapy. So bismuth, arsenic, mercury, lead, silver, if they are absorbed systematic systematically from therapeutic use or occupational or household uh, environments may discolor the gingiva and other areas of the oral mucosa. So this differs from the tattooing which is produced by accidental embedding of amalgam or the other metals. So this is because of uh, the amalgam metal which is caused tattooing over here. So this is a little different from the normal uh, physiological effects of amalgam. Uh, lead could also create a metallic pigmentation where there is bluish red or deep blue linear pigmentation of the gingival margin known as Burtonian line. Exposure to silver uh, uh, produces a violet line accompanied by a diffuse gray, bluish gray discoloration throughout the oral mucosa known as argaria. Gingival pigmentation from systemically absorbed metals results from perivascular precipitation of metallic sulfides in the subepithelial connective tissue. Gingival pigmentation is not a result of systemic toxicity. It occurs only in areas of inflammation where the increased permeability of irritated blood vessels permit seepage of metal uh, around the surrounding tissues. Pigmentation can be eliminated by treating the inflammatory changes without necessarily discontinuing the metal containing medication. Color changes associated with systemic disease, uh, endogenous oral pigmentation could be caused by melanin, bilirubin and iron. Exogenous cause disease also cause melanin pigmentation like for example the Addison's disease, Portjugger syndrome and the um, Albright's syndrome. So all this produces varying patches of uh, discoloration from bluish black uh, in, in areas in and around the uh, oral mucosa or the lips. Skin and mucous membrane can also be stained by the bile pigments. Uh, the deposition of iron in hemochromatosis could result in blue-gray pigmentation of the mucosa. Exogenous factors like for example at atmospheric irritants such as coal and metal dust could also cause uh, uh, changes. Tobacco causes hypercarotinosis of the gingiva which may induce a slight 
uh, increase in the melanin pigmentation of oral mucosa. Localized bluish black areas of pigment are often caused by amalgam implanted in the mucosa. So coming on to the changes in consistency of gingiva, in chronic gingivitis, both destructive and reparative changes coexist and the consistency of the gingiva is determined by their relative prominence. In chronic gingivitis, uh, as it's told already, that they both coexist. So here you can see that the firm and resilient nature of the gingiva is replaced by the uh, edematous natures of the uh, uh, of the disease so such conditions always suggest or always tell that there is an edematous change which is undergoing inside clinically uh, clinically if you see that there is a soggy puffiness that pits on pressure it means that inside or uh, the underlying microscopic feature is that there is an infiltration of fluid and cells of inflammatory x-ray Clinically, if you see, there is a marked softness, friability with ready fragmentation on exploration uh, with probe and pinpoint surfaces of redness and de desquamation. It means that there is a degeneration of the connective tissue and epithelium which is present and there is also a change in the connective tissue epithelial relationship uh, with inflamed engorged connective tissue expanding to few other epithelial cells of the surface. If there is a firm leathery consistency seen clinically, it means it is a, uh, associated with a long-standing chronic inflammation. So, these three are clinical changes which are seen during the chronic gingivitis phase, that is, when it is there for, uh, for a longer time period. But during acute forms of gingivitis, if you have, if you see clinically or if you feel clinically, there is a diffuse puffness and softness, then there could be a diffuse edema of acute inflammatory origin, fatty infiltration in xanthomatous. If there is flowing with grayish flake-like particles of debris adhering to the eroded surfaces, then it could be the underlying feature could be that there is necrosis with formation of pseudomembrane composed of bacteria, leukocytes, degenerated epithelial cells. If there is a vesicle formation, uh, underlying clinical uh, microscopic feature would be intracellular and intracellular edema with degeneration of nucleus and cytoplasm and rupture of the cell wall. So coming on to the changes in surface texture of the gingiva. So generally you would see an orange peel like appearance like this in a normal case of uh, uh, in a normal person with a, without any gingivitis. But then uh, which is restricted only to the attached gingiva and to the uh, central part of the uh, interdental papilla. Whereas, but in case when there is gingivitis occurring or when there is a gingival disease we're going to occur, the underlying um, edematous changes would not allow uh, this orange peel appearance to this orange peel appearance to appear. So this orange peel appearance is as a result of the epithelial uh, the red apex which uh, uh, which uh, uh, project itself into the connective tissue. That is the reason for the uh, appearance of this orange peel appearance. So, um, so in case of chronic inflammation, the gingivitis surface is either smooth, shiny or firm or nodular depending on whether the dominant changes are exudative or fibrotic. Whereas smooth surface texture is also produced by epithelial atrophy in atrophic gingivitis and peeling of surface occurs in chronic desquamative gingivitis. Hyperkeratosis results in a leathery texture and drug-induced gingival overgrowth produces a nodular surface. So you could also have traumatic lesions which are present uh, uh, which could be which could occur because of uh, um, any trauma which is induced. So the trauma could be in the form of uh, either chemical, physical or thermal. Chemical injuries related to aspirin, hydrogen peroxide, silver nitrate, phenol and endurantic materials. Physical injuries resulting in um, any uh, human induced injuries occurring in lip, oral, due to tongue piercing could cause gingival recession or thermal injuries resulting hot drinks and foods. So in acute cases, the appearance of slow erosion or ulceration and accompanying erythema are common, whereas in chronic cases, gingival defects results in gingival recession. Typically, the localized nature of the lesion and the lack of symptoms readily eliminate them from the differential diagnosis of systemic condition that may be present with erosive 
ஒரு ஒரு அல்சரேட்டிவ் ஒரு லீஷ் Now coming on to gingival recession, so this is uh, uh, determines to the position of the gingiva. By clinical definition, recession is the exposure of the root surface by an apical shift in the position of the gingival margin. So generally, you when uh, uh, when there is a gingival recession present, there are two uh, two positions of gingiva which we take into account. One is the apparent portion of gingiva and one is the actual portion of gingiva. The actual portion of gingiva determines where the junctional epithelium is present, whereas the apparent portion determines where the gingival margin is present. So whenever we are going to take the uh, uh, measurements, the actual uh, position of margin uh, has to be portion of the gingiva has to be taken into consideration for uh, the disease to be considered. So by definition, resistance is the exposure of root surface by an apical shift in the portion of the gingiva. So this could be because of age, faulty tooth brushing, tooth malportion, friction from soft tissues, gingival inflammation, abnormal frenum attachment, trauma from occlusion or orthodontic movement in the labial direction. It could also be because of uh, any uh, portion of the teeth in the arch could, due to crowding that could be a recession present. The root bone angulation, mesial distal curvature of the teeth. On rotated, tilted or facial displaced teeth, the bony plate is thinned or reduced in height. Pressure from mastication or moderate tooth brushing damages the unsupported gingiva and produces a recession. Clinically violating the biologic width could cause deepened periodontal pockets or gingiva recessions. So here you would see that uh, you would ask me what is biologic width. Biologic width is the distance between your uh, junction epithelium and the connective tissue. So this is generally 2 mm. So if this area is violated during your restoration placements, then you would be having uh, gingival recession. There is a change in portion of the gingiva. So for that, you do have three rules while you are doing your restorations uh, to prevent the uh, biologic width of violation. So this we would be again discussing it in further classes. Smoking could also cause recession but then uh, the exact significance has not been proved yet. Uh, clinical significance uh, uh, of recession, it could cause uh, caries to the root surface. Abrasion or erosion of the symptom could cause dental hypersensitivity. Hyperemia of the pulp and associated symptoms could be there. Interproximal recession creates oral hygiene problems and resulting in plaque, on, plaque accumulation. Changes in contour uh, may be associated with gingival enlargement, uh, but such changes occur in other conditions also. So, of historical inter interest are two terms such as Stillman's cleft and McCall's fist. Stillman's cleft have been used uh, to describe a specific type of gingival recession consisting of a narrow triangular shaped gingival recession. As the recession progresses apically, the cleft becomes broader, exposing the cementum of the root surface. When the lesion reaches the mucogingival junction, the apical border of the oral mucosa is usually inflamed and because of difficulty in maintaining the plaque at this site. Another term is the McCall's fistules, which has been used to describe a roll thickened band of gingiva, usually seen adjacent to the cuspids. These two terms, Stillman's and McCall's fistules, have been considered to be uh, a re a re occurring because of traumatic occlusion. Again, the association is not yet proved, so the recommended treatment is occlusal adjustments. So here uh, there is a tablo column wherein you can have all the uh, clinical features which are uh, present in their uh, healthy status and uh, clinical features which are present in their disease status, disease status, why there is a change in their disease status and the causes for its changes have been enlisted here. So kindly go through this chart, uh, even if the entire lecture is a little difficult, you can kindly go through this chart and um, uh, understand things better. So again, um, you can understand things better with this chart. So any doubts, you can always refer back to us. Thank you.